Yeah, I think that aspect you mentioned there about measurement of what works is so critical. And it's hard, you know, at the federal level, it may be more monolithic, but you look at states and cities, you can say, oh, wow, this city is doing something that's very different from uh, that city, and it's working. You know, Cory Booker uh, was on stage with me at the uh, Personal Democracy Forum last week, and uh, you know, he was just talking about reducing crime rates in Newark, and you know their metric. They, they actually have a metric they're trying to achieve, and you know it, it was very similar in a way to the way, you know, web developers think about you know some metric they're trying to drive on their website. And I think I guess I just want to say, even though it's an imperfect analogy event uh, to between laws and programs, I think there's a lot of fruitful work that we can do in in working that analogy. You know, I mean, uh, so it's, I, I just started with a riff on, you know, Carl's idea that law is the source code of our democracy. Uh, but this idea that we can, in fact, start to test and measure the outcomes. And I think some of the work that Vivek has been doing is starting to show us how we actually are producing the data that creates the potential for feedback loops about we, use, we did this program and it's working, we did this other program and it's not working. And Vivek, at least in the IT part of the federal government, is starting to close those loops and to kill things that aren't working. And I think, you know, that's part of, of where we can take this analogy. Uh, and uh, as I said, the, the, the community of people who will study the law, uh, the community of people that will implement the law, I think needs to uh, become uh, uh, sort of, it needs to move into the 21st century, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with some of these practices of, of, of open access and then, uh, as I say, feedback loops about measuring outcomes. And just to, sorry, just to add to the, um, the, the ability to actually shine light, uh, to give you an example, I remember when I first came on the job, I got uh, handed a PDF document, and I was told, welcome to your new job, and here are $27 billion worth of IT projects that are way behind schedule and over budget out of $76 billion worth of IT projects. I mean, that's when I decided there's no way you could manage uh, by PDFs that are generated on an annual basis. So the analogy I use is very much like uh, uh, a precision guided missile where you're getting feedback loops every millisecond in terms of where you are in relation to your target, uh, in terms of time and space. In the same way with a lot of these IT projects, as soon as we started shining light and we made sure that every CIO was telling us every 30 days where they were in terms of cost, schedule, and their rating, as a result of that, we've already seen results as far as uh, at the VA, for example. We halted 45 IT projects, terminated 12 of the ones that were not performing. We've done a number of tech set sessions where we've seen, uh, for example, at the SBA, they were spending $1,614 per card. This is your identification card, the smart cards, where the same exact card you could get at GSA for $240. And what we learned was a lot of people just don't know where they are in relation to the rest of the government or other entities. And the ability to really shine light and focus on performance, focus on being relentless about uh, evaluating how we're doing um, has a huge impact on implementation. And the ability to actually think through what is the new legislative process or management processes that we need to implement with uh, security, for example, we unearthed lots of issues, and that's why we're engaging with Congress uh, on rethinking the legislative process. So actually, I thought, <coughs> this on? Yeah, there we go. I actually thought you were going to say that when you took on the job, they handed you your head as opposed <laughs> to the PDF. Um, I'm, uh, now I'm, I'm levitating a little bit because I'm thinking about programs as analogies to um, the, the law and thinking how buggy programs are and how I'm thinking how buggy law must be mm -hmm. if the analogy holds up, and I suspect it does. Um, do you think that it can be made politically fashionable to have more openness and accountability? I think certainly the president has, has used that uh, tool in that, uh, that sense very successfully so far. But it seems to me that success in this domain is going to rely on the public deciding that the political process demands this kind of visibility and that elected officials can't get elected unless they subscribe to this notion of open uh, and very visible uh, process. 
So that's an important thing, an outcome that I think we need. Otherwise, this idea may not hold up well. Um, the other question, a very simple technical one. Um, I've noticed that companies are being asked by the SEC to produce their financial information in a particular form called XBRL. Uh, it's another markup language. It's conceivable that if we adopt practices along those lines, that more and more information will become machinably visible. Uh, and it could have two very valuable outcomes. One of them is merely openness and visibility, but this, especially with regard to the risks that people take when they invest in public uh, companies. But uh, the other thing uh, is that we may actually be able to use the information in ways we never could use it before because we didn't have the ability to use software to analyze what that's telling us. So I'm um, actually... I think the analogy there is a really good one. Um, you know, with what Google has done with the, the Google Book Scanning Project, I know it's been somewhat controversial, but there's some fundamental point that was made uh, is that this isn't necessarily about uh, humans reading all those books. It's about what can you do when computers can read all the books? So, you know, what kind of textual analysis can we do? Uh, what kinds of programmatic uh, comparisons? And I think there's a similar potential when all the law is online. Uh, you know, we actually, you know, yeah, you know, what we have seen is this explosion of complexity, which makes it impossible, I think, for the average citizen to understand the laws that govern them. And we need, uh, we either need radical simplification or lacking that, we need some power tools to help us, uh, you know, understand the impact of the laws that we produce. And, and so I, I, I kind of what I'm imagining here is this is the beginning of a, a new kind of, of legal science, uh, you know, where we can, in fact, uh, study the law using uh, the powerful tools that are at our disposal, where we can look and we can discover the conflicts, uh, you know, by uh, do, scanning and digesting all those laws and saying, well, this one over here conflicts with that one. What are we going to do? And we can start to surface those issues. We can, uh, uh, we can you know, build simulations of what are the outcomes. You know, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of things downstream uh, that would come out of this effort. That, and in fact, this also relates to the idea that, uh, you know, if we make all this free, aren't we taking away the economic opportunity of these companies that, that publish this stuff now? And I think, well, no, actually there's much bigger economic opportunity in creating new kinds of value-added tools for, uh, you know, uh, studying the law. Uh, uh, can, I, can, I, can I jump in just Yeah, please. Yeah, we should really make this interactive with everyone. We're, uh, no, no, I, 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 you guys, yeah. it's fascinating, absolutely. I just wanted to comment on two things. One is on the research applications, and I think one of the most compelling um, cases out there is that legal research today is unable to access the corpus. Mm -hmm. And at a couple of the Law.gov workshops in Colorado and Texas, we had some guys from Michigan come down that are doctoral students um, and lawyers, and they demonstrated a, a class of applications that have not been possible before, like deciding which legal cases are important based on citation analysis. And it was fascinating because they showed us a visualization of Marbury versus Madison mm -hmm. over time, and it wasn't very important. And then about 50 years later, it started to get cited and cited and cited, and it became one of the landmark cases. Now, with Marbury versus Madison, we know that sort of intuitively. But with some of the appellate decisions, maybe we don't. There's other classes of, of research that can't be done in the law school, such as analysis of patent litigation to see whether it varies across districts. So th that is one of the most compelling use cases, I think, of making the corpus more broadly available, is, is to begin analyzing. That. L let me make one more other brief comment, though, and that's on this bugs in the legal code issue. Um, the vast majority of the law are not Supreme Court decisions. They're not court cases. They're not murder cases. The vast majority of the law are things like the standard for the amount of lead you can have in paint, or what is a toxic chemical, or how do you define whether a school bus is driving safely. And I think some of those regulations and technical standards are much more amenable to this, this debugging process that that Tim has envisioned. So that, that, that's my interjection, and I'll let you get back. Actually, it's a, a very fascinating it's a very interesting interjection. Uh, the first immediate reaction I have is that when you have the corpus in machinable form, this still leaves you with the semantic problem of representing what's in that corpus. Uh, and this is something we're still struggling with. Uh, if you look at Google, Bing, and the other search engines, they are mostly matching text against text without any real understanding of what any of the words mean. 
uh, Tim Berners-Lee has been struggling with semantic web ideas for about a decade now, and it's still hard. Uh, I wanted to go back to a can concrete... I, can I jump in real yeah, quickly yeah. before you do that? Yeah. Uh, but we also have amazing breakthroughs. Um, they're spotty, to be sure, but where we find that there is some hidden semantic. And so, for example, location, great, great example. We are now able to surface all kinds of data around locations, yes. and our phones are now able to report our location, and therefore we can make all these things relevant. And I think in a similar way, we don't have to understand everything to be able to understand uh, you know, some key elements. And so it may be that, for example, we're able to identify an outcome, uh, you know, whether it's you know, reduced crime rate. Let's say we have laws uh, around uh, incarceration or uh, criminalization of this activity versus that activity. We can actually go and say, well, let's look at the presence of these laws in these 50 states and then look, let's look, look at the outcomes. And, and the meaning can come, sometimes work back from the outcome. Uh, uh, yeah. anyway, uh, no dis back, no yeah. disagreement with that at all. It, when you, where you have um, a, an organizing principle like location or time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can apply it in very, very general ways to the data you have. I'd be a little concerned about correlation versus causation. Yeah, no, it's an important anyway, sorry, thing you should to, get back to, to the balance. original point. I, uh, but I do want to pick up on something that Vivek mentioned and be very specific about it. Uh, you mentioned wine. It's a subject about which I'm quite interested because I have a modest wine cellar which is intended to be consumed. Uh, uh, as We're opposed, coming over as tonight. As opposed to admired, right. So uh, the point uh, I want to make is that I tried to ship some wine to a friend of mine in Chicago uh, earlier in the year, and I made the mistake of going on the web to find out what the rules were for movement of this product from one state to another. I discovered an entire matrix uh, it's a pairwise thing, and the states have different rules, uh, pairwise rules, so it's an n-squared problem. Uh, so I was going to suggest to you that if we were looking for a particular poster child problem space to deal with, <laughs> it would be wine shipments from state to state. And if we figured out a way to simplify that, we would have done a really great thing. It would be a worked, e a worked example of simplification. Uh, so people would be able to share this wonderful product. <laughs> I, I think we ought to hear from people yeah. sitting around the yeah. table who've been thinking about this stuff. Yeah. We got microphones. This is a controlled substance, uh, so to speak. This gentleman had his hand up right there. Yes. Well, just to carry your theme, I'm Paul Verkeil from the Administrative Conference, and I'm going to be summing up a little in a little while, which is going to be an impossible task. But I think these are brilliant presentations, and for someone who is a new government uh, official and trying to restart an agency who is concerned about this, it's, it's quite gratifying to hear from you. With respect to law and how you can determine whether a law is effective or, or whether you can debug it, you do have to use your wine example, the 21st Amendment, we decided long, you know, 1918, 19, that we were going to debug the problem by eliminating it. Well, that was not very successful. And it has taken us, and we changed our mind, you yeah. know, about after, we, after the, uh, the, the ineffectiveness of the law became so obvious, uh, where we created a whole criminal enterprise. We decided we would went on do it, and then we're back. And it only is last year or two years ago in the court, 5-4, they decided you could send your wine to another state, and the state laws couldn't prevent you from doing so. So I don't think it's so complicated. Wow, that's it's just, to me. But it's another problem with law, just to make the, the point. The law isn't only about what's on the books, right? It's about enforcement, and it's about a discretion in enforcement. And so that is why it's so hard to analyze. It's not about getting everything on the, you know, it would be nice if we could have all every law and we could look at them and find out flaws, but that only begins, opens the discussion, mm -hmm. the real discussion, the discussion we have to have in policy making, you know, in government is how do you enforce the laws and who does? Um, there's a beautiful example of a case in the Civil Rights Commission where there is, in Louisiana, uh, a justice of the peace who refuses to marry uh, mixed-race couples. And uh, he was told that in 1967, the Supreme Court decided that was impermissible. And he's still doing it. 
bleep. This gentleman needs a microphone. Do we have only the one? Oh, uh, John has I it. stolen the microphone. Uh, so there he is. It's like I'm, I'll, I'll pretend to be Ronald Reagan for the moment. Um, uh, so I have a couple of, of thoughts from really great presentation. Uh, one is that I think some of the complexity in the law is a reflection of the fact that in governmental systems, there are values being expressed that are not just about efficiency. Uh, Vint raised the SEC as, a, as, a, uh, as an example of having the uh, corpus in machine-readable form in terms of, of, the, uh, of the filings that are being taken for public companies. But the SEC now, right now is struggling with flash trading which is a different sort of problem yes. of corpus in machine readable form, mm -hmm. which used to be, I think, in, in, uh, in sort of uh, in, in the pre-ability uh, to really analyze data in, in, in virtual microseconds used to be thought of but perhaps as trading in front of your clients. Now enterprises are creating vast numbers of trades and, and wealth to their to their own companies, mm -hmm. uh, to their own trading systems, by do by executing flash trading programs. But I think to some extent there's a systemic risk that comes from that, and to to a different extent, there's a sort of a a, a latent unfairness to to average uh, traders in a system that permits the ability to to capture those rents. By being analyzed that, that analyze that corpus. So in government, I think lots of times the complexity is added by by a set of values that aren't just aimed at new product or efficiency. And I think we need to kind of introduce that into into the conversation. Um, and uh, uh, the other observation I think I would make is Vivek raised the issue of sort of doing what's, what works in the internal government systems uh, to try to enhance the productivity of the enterprise of government itself. But ultimately, I think the real test uh, is for the client's receipt or the delivery of government service, which I think is even a more challenging uh, problem or a more challenging question. It lends itself, I think, to what Tim was talking about. Uh, if you imagine the education reform movement and the use of data, et cetera, it lends itself to trying to debug uh, what's working and what's not working. But it's a it's a harder problem, I think, when you're when you're thinking about the cons the delivery of government service at the consumer side, than in terms of in, in using better business practice practices on the inside of government to enhance and make more efficient. Uh, the way the government's actually working on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I think, Vivek, you, you and, and, and the crew over there are really, I think, operating at both levels. And I wonder whether you share the thought that one's easier or more difficult or what your experience is on actually trying to see whether uh, the delivery on the consumer level side is being enhanced. So, so I think um, if we look at healthcare, for example, um, one of the things we realized was this principle of uh, shining light on the performance was, uh, was game changing in terms of allowing policymakers, managers to make different decisions. What was interesting is as we were looking at uh, the healthcare system, one of the challenges we found was that there was more transparency around actually buying a camera online and the ability to compare aperture size or cars online and the ability to compare um, speed, zero to 60, then there was one hospital to another, one doctor to the other. Um, and so, so we're looking at a body of work around how, how can we rethink CMS, literally the concept of dashboards applied to that model. Or what happened with a community health data initiative uh, that we're working on at HHS, where literally we just put the data out there and third parties started uh, taking that data and finding intersection. And, I, and I'm a true believer that intersection lies at the value of whether it's multiple disciplines or data set. So they literally took the geodata, 
combined it with funding data and layered on top of it outcomes data, and suddenly this map emerged around poverty levels in Texas and which county, how much money we were spending, what were the policy decisions that were being made. Um, I agree with you, That's, it's a harder issue to solve, but I think the only way we're gonna be able to solve it is by unlocking a lot of this public data. And I also think there's some really interesting advances that have been made, uh, geolocation being one of those, because it's very important, it grounds you. The other advance that needs to be made is around this common architecture around funding. Where are we spending money as a society? And laws play, obviously, <laughs> the role in terms of how money is allocated to solve some of the toughest problems we face from public safety to education to health care. Um, but, but it is a more difficult problem because we don't necessarily always own all the information that we need and we don't have what I call transparency at the atomic level, which is at the point of delivery. Mm -hmm. How do we get mm -hmm. that uh, atomic data to be able to then make general um, observations whether a program is working or not and where we should be doubling down versus where should we be divesting. Could, could I, I know you have your hand up, so we need to get the microphone down there. I wanted to make one small observation. A lot of uh, the, the phrase transparency, I think, is often interpreted as uh, how to expose those buggers who make bad decisions or do nefarious things. Uh, there's another utility in transparency that showed up in the internet related to something uh, that Tim said, uh, and I think Vivek also, and that's where when you share information, you allow others to help you evaluate, analyze it, and create tools for using it. So there is uh, a very positive potential that arises out of making information available, and that is that third parties can help evaluate it better. So there's a collaborative element in all of this, which is been fundamental to the Internet's evolution. The millions of people who do things to make information available or make it more easily discoverable or more easily used is what has allowed the Internet to become what it, ha what it is today uh, from its very humble origins. You have a question. Yeah. Um, hi, Rob Schechter. Um, as far on the issue of uh, now that we have these statutes and codes machine readable, you know, what can really happen? besides just presenting it nicely. Um, something that I've been really interested in implementing and working with is uh, the Library of Congress subject headings, which people are beginning to discover and think about new purposes for. And uh, this is just a great, and it's, it's online in a couple different machine forms, XML and another. Um, and so basically most people see it as a really interesting controlled vocabulary. Uh, how do you describe law? What are the various subtopics and subcategories? And for me, I find it really interesting because in every state, Oregon, we break up the laws and we talk about them in different ways. And it's, every state has done that. In New York, they have something called mental hygiene law. Uh, I don't, maybe a New York lawyer can explain that one to me. Um, sure. Cause yeah, is that right? We don't, we don't have that in Oregon, so. <laughs> yeah, so, so what I imagine is, and this wouldn't even be very hard, like an afternoon project per state, like a, a per, like software engineering terms, a per state adapter, translate mental hygiene in New York into the Library of Congress term, and then if, if that existed for each state, all of a sudden you have cross-state searching and knowledge, really. And, there, and people have already made, I believe, uh, this kind of adapter for France and for Canada, Canadian law as well, into Library of Congress subject headings, our Library of Congress for these other countries. Or I believe these other countries have actually adopted them, which is interesting. Um, and I had one other, I had a concrete uh, example of debugging the law, which, yeah, can be hard and there's, there's many subtle problems. And I think this will become more common as our sorts of tools become more common on the web. Um, one issue in law is uh, civil penalties that sometimes accrue to someone, not just criminal penalties when they've done something bad. If you've committed, been com if you've been committed, of, if you found guilty of robbery, maybe your landlord is allowed to kick you out now, but that's like a civil sort of a law. And sometimes due process concerns can come up because the burden of proof is different. Well. Um, once you have a collection of statutes and laws and each one knows into what sort of category it is, you can begin doing searches and comparing civil section of penalties versus criminal penalties um, and or white collar versus other kinds of crimes. And I found that 
the, this data is already there in the sense that the legislature for 100 years, in Oregon at least, they've created this wonderful index with terms like, if you want to search for dog, it'll say CK9. And to me, this is a, a tag cloud. They've been working on a tag cloud for 100 years, but they didn't consider it like that. It's this awesome ontology. And so this lets nice, intelligent queries be done. You know, how many links in and out are there to the to civil penalties versus criminal, et cetera? You know, th this whole uh, direction you're talking about makes me think a little bit of what we see uh, in the you know, private sector with things like uh, tax, you know, where TurboTax uh, lets, uh, you know, an ordinary person file their taxes more efficiently uh, because somebody has done the job of understanding the laws and regulations and turning it into an application. Uh, and obviously tax professionals still uh, you know, work the more complex cases, but you've actually automated uh, some of the simpler cases. And I do wonder if there are some real interesting applications um, you know, once we start to, to, to be able to look at all these laws, you know, can you actually build uh, better interfaces for citizens to actually do things that right now are very burdensome, you know, getting permits. You know, why do they take, you know, two months, six months, you know, because there's a long, complicated manual process. And it may well be that there is an automated process where you go, okay, we have understood all the, the things that we have to do here, and can we now build a better interface uh, to all the different places? I know there's one group, for example, that's working on this in the, uh, in the so social sector. You know, you're eligible for 40 different poverty reduction programs, and you have to apply 40 different times. Nobody does, and they're trying to do, uh, you know, the project called Intake One, where you know you basically fill out one form, and it figures out how to navigate the, uh, you know, the, the the various agencies to get you the benefits that you're entitled to. And I think it's, it's, it's sort of a whole set of applications applications, I think, that start to fall out of thinking about this as a system that you can start to engage with uh, via computing as well as, uh, as via um, you know, people sitting down and just reading it. Uh, th there was a series of presentations on access to justice, particularly at the uh, Chicago Kent uh, Law.gov workshop, and that's one of the things that they were most interested in. You know, the vast majority of, of legal proceedings are not done by lawyers. They're done by individuals trying to get into the system. Um, I believe in, in Florida, more than 50% of divorces are not involving lawyers, or they're pro se. And the access to justice people are very interested in making the law available and then simplifying the process of letting people deal with the legal system. And that's one reason that I think people like Professor Tribe uh, were here this morning and a lot of the access to justice people are, are very interested.